Bloch's theorem is a very powerful tool in quantum and condensed matter physics that allows us to tell how electrons and other wave-like particles behave in a periodic crystal lattice. The topic is a little bit advanced. However, if you have a basic knowledge of quantum mechanics and know what Euler's formula is, you'll probably be fine. It's really interesting, and I hope you enjoy the video. Imagine you had a line of dots that stretches out all the way to the left and all the way to the right, reaching out to infinity. Now, because this line is infinite, you could imagine that moving from one dot to another would make literally no difference. You wouldn't be able to tell which dot you're at. You couldn't tell if you were in the middle or at the ends because, well, there is no end. Of course, such a system doesn't exist in real life, but we can approximate it with just a really, really long line of dots. In this system, as long as you're somewhere in the middle, it would make almost a negligible difference if you were to move from one dot to another. You could then think about scaling this idea up to 2D, having an infinite plane of dots, or at least a really big plane. Notice that there is a distinct distance between these dots, at least in the example I've shown, and we can change that distance without changing the overall shape of the structure and the overall periodicity of this. We might call this a lattice, or a crystal lattice. Now you might scale this up another dimension, to 3D. Now you're modeling what most real crystals are like. This crystal, this 3D crystal, now has the same properties that we discussed before, those being that constant distance between points, which I'll refer to from now on as the lattice constant, as well as translational symmetry. Here I'll zoom in to show you. As you can see, as long as we move from one dot to another, which is basically the same thing as moving an integer multiple of the lattice constant, then we'll find that there is no change in the crystal lattice from the inside. You might have noticed a few discrepancies here, and that's simply because this crystal is not infinite. If it were, this would not be an issue. And since most crystals have trillions upon trillions of lattice sites, otherwise known as unit cells, there really isn't going to be that much of an issue, especially since most forces dissipate quite quickly with distance. But now let's scale it back down to one dimension. Everything I'll explain from now on will be able to be scaled up to two or three dimensions, but it makes it a lot easier to work with one dimension, both for visualization and it makes the math a little bit simpler. Now remember, we have this lattice constant that we can scale up or down, and this lattice constant is a constant. It's the same distance between all lattice points. Certain functions may behave similarly to this. For example, we have something like a sine wave here. A more formal term for this would be translational symmetry. Now, I brought up functions previously because we're dealing with a crystal and crystals are typically made up of atoms or molecules, which are small enough that quantum mechanics is very relevant. And quantum mechanics brings along with it the all-important wave function. Since our crystal lattice is periodic, it has this translational symmetry, the wave function should also be periodic. Or rather, the magnitude squared of the wave function should be periodic. And this is just a law of quantum mechanics if you're not familiar with it. An interesting observation about this equation is that because the quantum wave function is complex valued, we can actually stick a coefficient c on the left side here. Of course, the condition is that the magnitude of this constant c must be 1, which if you know any complex analysis means that c must be of the form e to the i theta. Also notice that I've gotten rid of the magnitudes, and this equation up top will be very important as well. So this gives us a bit of a generality, but it leaves us with some questions. Mainly, what is this theta here? In order to answer this question, we're going to make a bit of a ridiculous assumption. We're going to assume that this crystal is in the shape of a circle. Now, though this might seem a bit absurd, notice that this circular crystal retains the same property of translational symmetry. Along with that, it has something that we would call periodic boundary conditions. And all that means is that if you travel once around the circle, then you end up in the exact same spot where you started. 
This is a really useful property that we'll exploit in a second. For now, I'd like to justify why we can make this assumption. And all it really comes down to is just how many atoms are inside most crystals. Notice that as I increase the radius of this circle along with the number of points, that the edge of this circle becomes closer and closer to a straight line. And you can imagine in the limit as the radius goes to infinity, well, it actually does become a straight line. Of course, again, this doesn't exist in real life, but with how many atoms are in most crystals, we can approximate a crystal as just a really, really big circle. Or in multiple dimensions, it'd actually be a torus, but let's not think about that for now. Written in terms of our wave function, this tells us that psi of x equals psi of x plus na, where na says to move n, the amount of lattice sites, times the lattice constant. This is clearly equivalent to moving all the way around the circle. And thus, we can conclude that our constant c to the power n, by the same logic, must be equal to 1. Okay, now, and stick with me here, I'm going to put this circular crystal on top of the unit circle in the complex plane. Notice that when I do this, moving from one lattice site to another is the same thing as rotating by some angle theta in the complex plane. And remember, doing so is the same thing as multiplying by e to the i theta. Now notice that because the angular spacings are all equivalent, we can rewrite each angle theta as 2 pi times some integer divided by n, the number of lattice sites. This then tells us that each one of these angles, these e to the i thetas, are what we call nth roots of unity, which we can write as e to the i 2 pi s over n, where s is some integer. And believe it or not, we've actually just figured out what our solution is. These nth roots of unity fit our requirements for our constant c. They have magnitude 1, and you can check for yourself to see that raising them to the power n will always yield 1. Okay, let's return to our original equations now. We found what theta is, and we know that c must be equal to e to the 2 pi i s over n, where s ranges from 0 to n minus 1, because n would be the same thing as 0. Then psi of x plus s a equals e to the i 2 pi s over n times psi of x. And this is actually Bloch's theorem, though we typically write it as e to the i k a psi of x, where k is 2 pi s over n a. The reason for this I'll touch on a little bit later in this video, but the full reason will be left for another video. Remember, this is also just in one dimension. Now, there is a different representation of Bloch's theorem that we can derive from our results so far. This new representation will tell us exactly what form psi of x takes. Now, if you were to just guess that, you might guess something like e to the ikx. And in fact, this does meet our boundary conditions. The true answer is close, it's e to the ikx, but times some new function u of x, where u of x has the periodicity of the lattice. That is, u of x plus a equals u of x. You can think of this as something like a unit cell function. In fact, the sinusoid I've drawn below is representative of one of these unit cell functions. I know I just went through a lot of algebra, so here's an example with some visualization. I've drawn out three axes here, RE, IM, and X. RE and IM are the real and imaginary number lines which form the complex plane, and X is the line along which our crystal lattice lies. You can see I've drawn out our unit cell function along with e to the ikx. You can think of e to the ikx as an envelope function to which u of x will conform. And you can see now that it's sort of like a helix where our unit cell function has been sort of wrapped into the plane of e to the ikx. Note that while I displayed the u of x function as only being real valued, this is not necessarily the case, and u of x can be complex valued. And in this case, it wouldn't be wrapped so nicely, but rather every point would be rotated an angle kx corresponding to whichever point it was at. You can now see this blue dot, and I'm going to move it along psi of x, an integer multiple of a, the lattice constant. 
each time I do this, notice that the vector from the blue dot to the x-axis does change. It does rotate, however, its magnitude remains the same. I hope this little demonstration helped with your understanding, as it did mine when I was animating. Alright, this is the full Bloch's theorem then. It tells us that our wave function, our electron wave function, can be written as the complex exponential function times some periodic function u of x. And because of that, whenever we translate an integer multiple of a, the lattice constant, our wave function differs by a phase factor which happens to be an nth root of unity. Okay, so the key takeaways are that our electron wave function is dependent on this periodic, what I'm calling a unit cell function. Whenever you shift by the lattice constant, that is an integer multiple of a, you'll pick up some phase factor e to the i k a. And finally, something you might have noticed is that this k number that I've written up here has a striking resemblance with the k when you write a sinusoidal plane wave, that is 2 pi over lambda. In fact, this k and that k are very related, and we'll talk about how this k is related to what we call the crystal momentum, along with what's referred to as reciprocal space in the sequel to this video. All right, thanks for watching. This is the first like fairly big video I've made with Manim, and I think it turned out all right. I know that I glossed over quite a few things, However, the main purpose of this video was to give sort of an intuition for what Bloch's theorem means. I think that there are plenty of good resources online for deriving Bloch's theorem rigorously, and I've linked a few of those in the description. If you have any suggestions, please leave them in the comments, and I hope you enjoy the video.